spokesperson at Westminster for the SNP. Editor of the men's lifestyle magazine Loaded in the Noughties, a former Labour Party supporter, elected as an MEP for the Brexit Party last May, Martin Daubney, and chief executive of Bernardo's, the oldest and biggest children's charity in the UK, Javid Khan. Welcome to our panel, to our audience here and, of course, to you at home. Joining the conversation, you can argue along in the usual way using hashtag BBCUT on Facebook, on Instagram and on Twitter. Right, let's start with our first question tonight, which is from Anju Trevedi. Thank you. Should I be jumpy for joy or crying in light of the new Brexit plan? <laughs> oh, so, Matt, have you been jumping for joy today? Well, I think it's a very Like a spring good... rabbit. I think it's a very good deal, and I'm, in, I'm very pleased that we've got a deal. I think it's incredibly important that we deliver on the result of the referendum because we're a democracy, and that's what democracies do. I think the deal is a good one for the UK. I think it's a good one for Northern Ireland. And I think it's I mean, good... the DUP it... obviously don't share that view. Well, I think it's good for Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland get the best of both worlds. They uh, retain... Um, no, there's no hard border on the island of Ireland. There'll be no checks uh, at or near the border. Uh, and yet they are... Northern Ireland remains, uh, and, of course, within the UK, uh, within the UK customs arrangements. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a good deal. And crucially, crucially, after three and a half years, almost, after the referendum, this deal should be backed by my colleagues at Westminster on Saturday, and then we can get this done, and we can move forward and concentrate on all the other things that matter and deliver on the referendum and then move the country forward. So when Boris Johnson said, leave Northern Ireland behind as an economic semi-colony of the EU, damage the fabric of the Union with regulatory checks and even customs controls between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, no British Conservative government could or should sign up to any such arrangement. He said that last year. How is that not what he's doing now? Well, that, that isn't the, in the deal. Yeah, the plastic checks up. No, the... No, the Northern Ireland and Great Britain leave the European Union within the same customs arrangement. And there they... will be customs checks for some goods going between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. This is... It, in order to be able to leave, we're leaving the whole country leaving together with one uh, within the UK uh, customs <coughs> arrangement, as opposed to leaving the whole country within the customs union. But more important than that, more important than that, this deal allows us to move the country forward. We've been riven by this Brexit row for more than three years, and this deal allows us to get Brexit done. Crying or jumping for joy, Annalise? Well, certainly not very happy. I mean, I'm, I'm not crying because I want to try and get something done about this. I'm, I'm afraid that actually what, what Matt said, particularly about the Northern Irish arrangement, <coughs> just is not what's written in paper as part of that deal. Actually, it says for any good in Northern Ireland that is going to be exported um, uh, or that could become part of an export or where there might need to be extra checks, it will be part of the EU customs union. So what you would have is two different customs approaches occurring at the same time. Well, maybe you can explain why all those Northern Ireland businesses that are concerned about this have got it wrong and why um, your government are the only people who are saying that this will be simple to operate, because I don't think anybody else is. But, of course, that's even without talking about the fact that this deal just opens us up to years of wrangling because it says we don't have to keep in step with the EU on working rights or environmental protections or consumer standards. So we could have years and years of argument with the EU after this and indeed with other countries, particularly with the US. You know, this would open us up to a trade deal with the US where we could see our working rights slashed, our environmental protections go, uh, uh, go to the wall. And I just don't think that's what people voted for, for when they voted to leave. So I don't think this is the deal that we should be celebrating. Well, let's see what people think of it, shall we? Lots of hands up. Uh, yes, the man here in the, in the blue sweater. Hi there. If uh, Boris really wants the support of the DUP, why don't you just pay him off as Theresa did two years ago? <laughs> just pay him. Okay, that's one approach. We want to talk to you about that, Matt. Yes, the woman in the glasses. 
Is anybody else sick and tired of listening to Boris Johnson's cabinet members constantly repeating the same unconvincing messages over and over again as if we're going to fall for it, as if we actually believe that on Saturday it's all going to come right and you're going to suddenly start spending money on the NHS, on public services, yeah. because you aren't and nobody believes you anymore and nobody will believe you ever again. That is exactly... Uh, that is... By getting this deal through Parliament on Saturday, that is exactly well, what we, we can you do. Won't. You won't. And I understand how frustrating it is for people it won't that this has been going on. It's and infuriating. It's infuriating. And let's get it done. And when you come to the NHS and the money that we can spend on the NHS, here in Leicester, we are rebuilding the hospital. And we're able to do that because the economy is strong. And with this deal, the economy will stay strong and we can get Brexit oh, sorry. delivered. You're lying. So you're, you're, downgrading, you're, lying. you're downgrading one of the other hospitals. There may be one that you're improving, but there's another one that yes. you're downgrading, actually. It's just £450 million pounds into Leicester, and we're able to back the NHS in Leicester because with this deal, the economy will be strong and we'll deliver on the result of the referendum. With and this cabinet, we will continue to be lied to over and over again, as long as it's convenient. The man there with the white shirt and the grey jacket. Here we are after three and a half years and we're at the same place where we were a few years back. There's been no progress. You are utterly, utterly out of tune with the rest of the public here. Yeah. You will not represent us, what we voted you in for. And it's a crying shame that we're at this avenue right here, right now. You better negotiate on Saturday because it concerns our futures, our children's futures. And this is something that you ought to hang your heads in shame if you get it wrong. I just wanted to ask if you've been to the hospitals in Leicester. They're filthy and falling yeah, apart. Yeah, absolutely. I was there uh, about a month ago. They're in the hospital. Yeah, I was there at the hospital. <coughs> We've rebuilt the A&E, which is much better, but the rest of it absolutely needs rebuilding. We're putting £450 million into Leicester hospitals because they are not good enough at the moment. I can't believe the Labour Party's against it, but we're doing I'm that. I'm not against it. I just think you've got to be honest about the reality of what Jeremy you're Corbyn doing. Today you said you were going to fix it. It's, 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 it's not right. in. So we're putting, we're putting half... Matt, you said you'd create 40 new hospitals. Manager. Within five minutes, that was blown no. apart. Let's just yeah. be honest Toilets with people. and everything are filthy. It's not... It Absolute isn't just a money issue. They're disorganised. They're inefficient. We, it's, not a, it's not a case of throwing money at it. It, it. But this hospital in Leicester and many of others around the country need to be turned around. The, we need more people working in them as well, and we're going to do that. And let's get on to debating things like the NHS, and to do that, we can get Brexit done, and then we can get on to the NHS and all the other things that we need to talk about as a country. <coughs> the man there, yes, with the, the dark jacket and the blue shirt. It's all well and good saying that you're going to invest loads of money into Leicester Royal Infirmary. What about Glenfield or the general? Um, can you guarantee that there's going to be a net benefit in terms yes. of beds, in terms of, yes. you know, as a whole? Yes. Already, Leicester Royal Infirmary is... It's too crammed. There's nowhere to park. Yes. The roads can't yes. cope with it. All this extra traffic. How's it going to cope with it? Yes. Yes. We can do all of those things and we've guaranteed the money to okay. Leicester and it's coming in the next couple of years. OK, <laughs> Leicester, you've heard it from the health Absolutely. secretary himself. Whether yes. you believe him, it's entirely up to you. Yes. Let me just drag us back to the original question, yeah. Yeah. which is about the Brexit plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Javid. What was your response uh, so, to what you heard today? So, uh, uh, to be absolutely honest with you, I think like most of this audience and all the millions of people watching the programme, I don't know whether it's a jump for joy or a, a cry situation. Uh, and this is part of the problem that we've found ourselves in, and the politicians, with great respect, you know, are having a, a field day in debating all of this, arguing, disagreeing, arguing and disagreeing again, and who knows what's going to happen on Saturday. What we need to bring it back to is the, the Joes and the Abdols and the Wreckers and the Marys out there in this audience and across Leicester and the rest of the UK who are suffering at the moment. Suffering, one, because they don't know what's to come, so the uncertainty, the lack of confidence in the future, their fears for their children, as the gentleman was saying. And remember, these are the children who are going to live with the consequences of this decision far, far longer than, you know, than our lifetimes. We've got to get it right. Now, there is some hope, I think. It's good to see at least that there's been some progress today. I, personally, I wasn't expecting anything today. So that's, you know, let, let's, let's give credit where it's due. Something has been put on the table and it's going to be debated. I think the politicians have got a huge responsibility on Saturday 
to really test out the detail of what's been presented. My, my test, for example, my advice would be that make sure that whatever deal, if, if this deal is suitable, if you agree it, that it is uh, manageable in terms of the economic shock risk for this country. Because if there is a shock, the one that we are expecting, you know, don't, no deal would have been much worse, I think. It's going to affect all of our lives in ways that we can't predict yet, you know, in terms of education, employment, job prospects, skills, housing, you name it. People losing faith in the government and in their own futures. We cannot allow that to happen. So deploy that test. Be absolutely sure if you're going to sign us up to this because you have that power, then make sure that we pass that test. Make sure that there's a medium and long-term plan as well, that you're not just getting yourself out of a sticky wicket now because that's what politicians can do very easily. That it's got to be a longer-term view because we're going to have to live with this for years to come. Is it of the deal so far. Does anyone in the audience support the deal that Boris Johnson has? Yes. One person. One, no, we've got two... <laughs> two people. Two, three hands. Three. But yes, let's hear yes. from the white teacher. Um, so I think we've had enough now. It's gone on, as we mentioned, for three and a half years. And although we have reached an impasse, arguably you can say that it's caused by some strong Brex Brexiteers who haven't supported Theresa May's deal. But there's also accountability on the other side of MPs who have opposed the deal time after time. And I think it's clear now more than ever that opposing MPs will never support a deal brought by this government, no matter how good it is, how bad it is. And if on Saturday we don't support this deal, will they take accountability and responsibility if we leave with no deal? So really, as good, as, good or bad as the deal is, it's sort of like we've waited a long time for this. It's finally happened. I think we've just got to take it, set up for it, because... Let's be real, we're going to wait another six months, another 12 months, another 24 months until we get another deal. Might get slightly better every time, but we haven't got the time for that. We voted leave. That's it. We need to leave now. Otherwise, no deal is the only other option I can think so of. So you're thinking any deal will do? Yeah, any, any deal at this point, because it's sort of... We saw from the last deal that it just got shut down three times, and if it's going to get shut down three times more and three times more and three times more, there's no mm. point, right? Just get it done. There we go. Martin? So I'll tell you, who is jumping for joy about this deal? Michelle Barnier. Emmanuel Macron. They were beaming with delight today. And on the way over here, <coughs> I heard a Belgian MEP on the Brexit Steering Committee called this deal, Theresa May's deal, without the backstop. Three people in Leicester support it. And I think on Saturday, it will be voted down. And your lot, Corbyn, today said they won't vote for it no matter what. You haven't even seen the deal. And you were going to vote it down. That's not true. You've it's utterly true. You betrayed, it utterly betrayed with it five million, five like million Labour voters, including myself, I've voted Labour all my life until I got into this, were betrayed by your party. But you who just were said refusing... that you don't like the deal yourself. Sorry, I'm confused. Martin, no, hang on. Listen, listen, before you, you have a go at Labour, what's your referendum? position? What's Labour your position, Martin? Referendum. Our position is this. Give Boris credit. This is not the worst deal in history. It's the second worst deal in history. <laughs> when you go through this deal, and, and I've actually been through this in Brussels today, here is the small print. You start to look at the political declaration, there are, there are key things which are not Brexit. The so-called level playing field means we cannot do trade deals with the rest of the world on more favourable terms than the EU already do them. We're going into business deals with our hands tied behind our backs. The fishing opportunities quite clearly state here that we have shared stocks and quota shares. We will not get back control of our fishing waters. This is an absolute betrayal of our coastal communities, including in Scotland, and the more you look into it, military alignment, um, regulatory alignment, foreign aid alignment, this is Brexit in name only. We've once again betrayed the British people. Three and a half years in, we cannot move forward, and the public have every right to feel furious about this, in my opinion. I mean, I think the slogan, get Brexit done and then we do other things, is nonsense. I mean, this isn't even the divorce. This is actually the bloke sleeping in the spare room, you know. We haven't got anywhere near the divorce. So this is the beginning of the beginning. I did wonder where that analogy was going, did yeah. you? So, so in actual fact, Brexit, Too much will be, Brexit will be hanging over the UK for the next decade. There is no question about that. Yeah. And this idea, get Brexit done, you know, I mean, if you had someone who you were trying to talk down from self-harm, would you just go, yeah, I'm fed up now, just get on with it? No, you wouldn't. And the thing is, there is nothing in this deal that would be remotely like what we have now. And two words that are missing from it. One is frictionless, and the other one is Scotland. Scotland doesn't get a mention 
Anyway, and I'm sorry, you talk about fishing opportunities. Well, my constituency is a fishing constituency where we catch langoustine, 85% of which goes to Europe. Northern Ireland fishing boats are just off our coast. They will be able to land through Northern Ireland. And, you know, I'm from Northern Ireland. I don't begrudge that. But fishing on the west coast of Scotland will be absolutely hammered by this. And as someone who spent 33 years in the NHS, everyone's NHS will be hammered by this. How many Europeans have ever looked after you as doctors or nurses? These are the people who look after us. These are the people who work in our universities doing research. We are losing so many health benefits by coming out of Europe, including the wee plastic card that if you're sensible, you have it in your wallet. You know, we talk about, oh, avoid no deal because we'll have medicine shortages. The end place is a Canada-style free trade agreement. That means we are a long way from Europe. That means there is lots of friction and we lose a lot of options. And for us in Scotland, our European citizens are critical both to our public services, but also our rural communities. And we can't afford to lose freedom of movement. It's been a huge benefit to every single one of us and many of our young, pardon me, many of our young people. I just like to say something that I never thought I'd leave my mouth, which is I think Boris Johnson has done a brilliant job with going over there. Everyone said, everybody said, oh, you can't, he won't do this, he can't do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he's actually, he's proven everybody wrong. And from my perspective, it seems to me that um, no matter, you know, he's just knocking things out of the park and people just can't stand it. And that's really got, you know, people like myself, like, more interested again. Like, oh, actually, this guy wants to do it for the people, wants to do it. And he's really pushing forward. Now... Another point I'm going to make is the DUP and the EU seem to be really levering the island backstop thing for the whole of Brexit. There's thousands of issues, I'm sure, to do with Brexit, but it's always to do with the Good Friday Agreement, the DUP, the Northern Ireland backstop, all this. I'm like, well, what's, why does that one issue stop and put a, a big break on the whole thing and we have to negotiate around that? And, why doesn't it, you know, it's going to sound crazy, but Ireland being referred to as Ireland, the island of Ireland, why don't we try and just get that as an island again and then we can carry on with our own thing? Uh, what, what, just <coughs> no longer have Northern break Ireland... Break up as, the union. Uh, yes, break yeah. up, not, no longer have it as part of no. yeah, just the United Kingdom. Ireland, the whole of Ireland. Well, the Scottish government put forward a compromise. We were the first... But you weren't suggesting that. No, but we... <laughs> our, our compromise in Scotland's place in Europe in December 16, so nearly three years ago, was to respect that two of the nations of the supposed precious union had voted to remain. So, yes, we'd be out of the EU, but to allow both nations to stay in the single market... Being and part of the United Kingdom. And, yeah, we'd, we'd have stayed part of the United Kingdom, but we'd have been allowed to have a single market and customs union, Northern Ireland and Scotland... Scotland voted we to would have stay in, in the United Kingdom. Yeah, a, quite a different United Kingdom, where we were promised the only way that we okay. could remain in the EU was to vote no. You're a part of the but, United Kingdom. Yeah, and you've completely ignored us for three years. <laughs> we voted to remain. We're not mentioned in the deal. We've been treated with contempt. And yet our solution of both nations being in single market and customs union would have solved the Irish border issue overnight. I think that this is... I think this is a good deal. I think many people said that we would never pull it off and that Boris Johnson would never pull it you off. Well, yeah. you didn't think he'd come You ran against it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and then I... And then I... <laughs> And then I, I did. And then and I, and then when I pulled out, no and then when I, did. when we, when I pulled out of the leadership race, I backed Boris because he had the <laughs> biggest chance of anyone of getting a deal, and that's exactly what he's done. And I think the most extraordinary spe spectacle today, of many spectacles today, has been Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party announcing they want to delay Brexit. No, we didn't say that. That is the Brexit that, that, party that's fake themselves. News. I'll tell you what actually happened. Well, well, I, I, I read it on Twitter Oh, myself. it must have been true. From <laughs> Nigel Farage, his own Twitter. account. What, what so, actually happened is, a, is that the Brexit party has, has been consistent, saying we want to leave with a clean break Brexit on October 31st. That's now not going to be possible. And I, do, I don't even think Boris has deals with it. Do you honestly think it's going to get voted through on Saturday? Yes. And this is a second referendum, and, yes. and the SNP wants a second referendum, yes. and, and the Liberal Democrats want... That's what they're heading for. 
They're, they're using this as another delaying tactic to push for a second referendum. And what's even going to be on that ticket? Will we even have a proper leave on that ticket? Or will it be remain and, and a version of Hang on, let, remaining? There's a question about exactly the that, betrayal. Let, let's hear it. Sean Kent, where are you? Thank you. Isn't it time for MPs to ratify the deal and get Brexit done? <laughs> OK, so let's see who's going to vote for this deal, then. So you're not going to vote for this deal on Saturday, well, I'm you... an MEP, so... I, I, no, no, of course you're not, of course you're not. You. But you're not supporting <laughs> it, you're quite right. You're not supporting this deal. And, I mean, Matt was talking about Brexit Party suggesting there should be an extension. You've been telling us for years you want to get out of the EU. But the, I, too, read that no, comment no, so, by so, Nigel so, Farage. So, so, who thinks there should be an extension no, now. So, so what was stated was the Ben Act is now in... And whether we like that or not, which we don't, obviously, because... Yes, because you've called it the Surrender Bill. Yeah, well, so, so is Boris. And a lot, lot, of, lot of Brexiteers have, and I think rightly so. It is a Surrender Bill. And we don't want that, but it's, it's there. And so we must obey it. But if that is you... So you're supporting that. So what I'm say, no, no, what I'm saying is, if that is a tool of government, which I don't particularly like, but it's there, then we must obey it. This is about consistently obeying democracy, whether we like it or not. I, I don't, don't like the I, I, I'm confused. We've got a Brexit party that wants to delay Brexit. No. Liberal Democrats who no longer want a democratic vote. We don't want to delay vote. Brexit. We've got a Labour party that no longer supports working people. What is oh going my, on? on? Let's <laughs> just get fact, on and deliver sorry, Brexit. Sorry, Annalise. <laughs> sorry. So, it's, yeah. Tell us your position. <laughs> but thank you. I mean, the whole one of the main reasons, Matt, why we cannot accept this deal is because even worse than Theresa May's deal, it does not include any commitments to uphold working rights into the future. And you know, when we talk about what the future is going to look like, you know full well that actually that withdrawal agreement is mainly what would be voted on on Saturday. And the political declaration, without getting into all of the jargon, but that's what sets the framework for the future, that is incredibly thin. It's taken out any long-term legally binding commitment on issues like working rights. We've got a Prime Minister who seems determined to push ahead with trade deals with, you know, for example, President Trump in the United States. Okay. Well, there they've got 10 days holiday in the let, US. Can I, just I don't let, want let, us to end up with let, that let, in Let's address the question. Yeah. Sure Trump all kind of old-fashioned like that. But is it time for MPs to ratify the deal and get Brexit done? That's the question from Sean. So on Saturday... Have you been told what you're voting for? What's Labour going to do? Well, we can't accept the deal that's been presented to us, but to answer that question, when people say, will this be getting Brexit done, it won't be for the reason that I just said, because what's being presented to us, yes, is detail on the withdrawal, <laughs> but then we don't have a clear idea about what would happen into the future. Where it's not clear to us, for example, what the trade deal would look like with the EU, right? So, there isn't so, that detail So there. what's your, your plan? Is it, just, just to, to try and get some clarity, is it second that you're not referendum. going to vote for the deal? Would you vote for the deal if there is a second referendum attached to it? Well, well, I think it's really important that now people have the chance to say whether this is what they want... No. We've already had a say! To... No, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong. 17.4 million people that's had a say. It's been consistently ignored. No. What's happened since then, with respect, it's the promises that were made during that referendum campaign, and I remember them all. I remember people saying to me, don't worry, we'll you still be You rejected today's deal we'll without still... even seeing it, because yeah. you want a second Sorry. referendum. Can I, don't, can I be honest. Can I can finish? Have... Let my land finish. Finish. Okay. Thank you. Um, I remember being told that we wouldn't have complicated customs procedures, that we wouldn't have all that paperwork, that we keep in step with the EU. None of that is in this deal, what we were promised by the Leave campaign. It's simply not there. Yes, in Parliament we've been voting on this. So, so just, but just but so I, I, I'm, I'm still not quite clear, just to, just to really try and understand this. When the vote comes on Saturday, what is Labour going to be voting for? Is it going to vote against the deal, that's the end of it, or is it going to vote for the deal with a second referendum attached? Well, I think everybody will know that we can't foretell now which amendments are actually going to be chosen. If there was one <coughs> which said that we could Just have... Be honest. a be I am being honest. Sorry, Give that's people the way that clarity. The, with respect, that's the way the House of Commons works. I wish I could kind of... Well, in fact, I don't wish that I could direct the Speaker to tell us exactly what to do, oh, because I think he's got to arbitrate between yeah, all the Yeah, the Speaker, the default Prime Party. Minister. Martin, Martin, don't don't yeah. please. Can I? Yeah. In the blue jacket. Thank you. With uh, due respect, Matt, you've sacked off your majority. You've not got the support of the DUP. Talk to us about Plan B. Yeah. Mm. Let's just... I'm going to get onto that in a moment. I'm just going to deal with the, with the primary question, which is, isn't it time for MPs to ratify the deal and work out who is going to and who isn't? Uh, yes, 
the man there in the black T-shirt with the white sleeves? Um, obviously, now, all parties reckon they've got the best deal in place, whatever. <coughs> it's deal after deal after deal. At the end of the day, during the re UK referendum, it wasn't leave with a deal, leave without a deal, remain. It was just leave or remain. We voted leave. Three and a half years later, we've still not left. Yeah. And we're still sitting here debating deal after deal that we know isn't going to get through Parliament. Mm -hmm. This Ben law that's been created to stop the Brexit happening is ridiculous. It shouldn't have even been put through Parliament. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be here debating Class. deals now. Well, we should be out. Okay. Yeah. the glasses. Hi, yeah. Uh, um, the... The thing is, isn't it cowardice, really? Because you all want, or oh, sorry, except for the Conservatives, the, they all want to have power without responsibility. Have an election. Yeah. Then, yeah, if, yes. if Labour win, do what you want. <coughs> if the SNP win, do what you want. But have an election. They don't That's want the best way to let the people decide. But you're afraid that the people, well, you're not, you are totally afraid of the people, otherwise you'd actually go and, yeah. you know, call me and do what you said. Bring it on. Yeah. 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 Um, I, actu I actually believe that another election is just going to be a referendum. So if that's what you're going to request, then people are just going to vote according to Brexit. Going back to the other point, if I was Boris, I'd be pretty embarrassed right now because this is not the Leave campaign that he or the deal that actually promised voters all that time ago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of Sean's question and the vote on Saturday, Philippa? What's your position? Are you going to vote against it? Are you going to vote for it, but with a referendum I, attached? I mean, well, we, we're going to vote against it. I mean, my job as an MP even is... Even if a second referendum is attached to it? Even if a second referendum is attached to it. I mean, obviously, if there's... I mean, at the moment, you don't know how things are going to be put forward. It might well be because we have supported the idea of a second <laughs> referendum. Because Nigel Farage was saying things like, oh, we won't leave the single market. Who would think of that? You know, a trade deal that's the work of an afternoon. What people were told in 2016 is nothing like the reality. So, obviously, we have supported that. But my constituents, my country, every single local authority in Scotland voted Remain. 62% of us voted Remain, and we've been ignored. So, I'm sorry, this is worse than Theresa May's deal, hard as I would have thought that was possible to imagine. And also being from Northern Ireland, I haven't got all the way through it, but on the train trying to read, the Joint Council will, will decide this and the Joint Council will decide that. There's lots of things that are actually just about Northern Ireland are a fudge. And we actually have no idea whether that's going to work or not. And we've had so much about consent for Northern Ireland. But what about Scotland's consent? We didn't consent to this and we're not being allowed. We're told, you know, Northern Ireland might get to vote every four years. But Scotland can't have another vote on its future for 25 years. Where's the democracy in that? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, 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 as, as politicians are working this out, and hopefully they are working it out, uh, better than we're seeing tonight, uh, is that they really dig deep, really dig deep and remind themselves why they came into politics in the first place. Mm. I mean, because I believe, you know, Matt Hancock, a senior politician, came into politics because he wanted to create a better world for the people of this country. And that would apply to all of you, I'm sure, and all of your colleagues in, in, in the Commons. You can't do that with a Punch and Judy show like this. You just can't, right? It's not helping. this deal is going to make people... ordinary people poorer, well, David, well, that, that, and that must well, that, be something that, 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 that's, that's, that's important That's my next to you. point. That's my next point, because, because if we get this wrong, the poorest in our society will suffer the most. Mm. That's what happens at the most difficult times. Yeah. That's going to be your legacy. But the poorest when you're thinking about your vote. to vote Brexit because the system has completely let them down well, already. Well, well let's, let's think you know, about This is the point. Let, let, let's talk about the vote. Then. So, okay. let, the let, point, let I'm, I'm as democratic as you. You know, we know there was a majority, 17.4 people, three years ago. There's another one and a half million at least people now who are voters who didn't get a chance to speak. There we go. Ago, right? There we go. It's a fact. It's a fact. You there we go. Like it, but these so are young people. Next, you say all people have died and and and, and remain would win. Look, these, mean, these, are the, way. these are the young people that have helped us. Uh, um, now we can spell climate change. We couldn't before, right? We weren't talking about it. They are the future. These are the young people that want to be part of the future vision of this country. Why should their views be ignored?
They're well, going to we be... had a referendum in 2016. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, but there is uh, no uh, harm in the current yeah. circumstances, only in the current circumstances. Like I say, I'm a Democrat. I believe in majorities. You know, well, if you're a Democrat, you it. believe in democracy, so let's honour the first I referendum. But, sure but, but look where it's got us. Look at, look at the three years. Look where it's got us. This is what it has created. Pol politics because is divided. Po society, because communities are divided. The families Martin, are divided. You've just got to let Javid speak Thank you, Paul. and not keep interrupting. Thank you. Sorry. Families have become divided over this issue. And we've got to rebuild these bridges. We've got to create a cohesive community again, a cohesive country, the country that we're all very proud of, we've all grown up in. That's what we want to see. That's what the public of this country want to see. Politicians have got to move on from their own political egos, their own political ambitions, and remember what really matters to the people of this country. Let's take another question from Idris Sheikh. Thank you. Now that the DUP have been thrown under the bus, who will Boris turn to to push through the deal? So, Matt, what have you been doing on this score? <laughs> well, I think that this vote will go through on Saturday, and I very much hope it will, partly because then we can move this whole debate which has got stuck forward. I don't think there's going to be a second referendum. Can I just ask you, do you think the DUP have been thrown under the bus? No. Because they're clearly very unhappy about it. And just, I mean, you know, it's, no, it's, it's I, a fantastic complex paper that sets out the deal but just one thing that that caught my eye which is looking at the regulatory alignment of northern ireland with ireland for, for for many goods so the regulatory alignment of northern ireland with the eu which will mean in fact that 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 northern ireland part of the uk will be governed by eu laws mm -hmm. over which Northern Ireland has no control. Well, Northern Ireland... Is that Ireland, not the case, or have I that's, misunderstood? That's, that's not the case. And the reason is that Northern Ireland will have to express its consent over that every four years to approve whether they... But after it's they... happened, it will, it will, it will, if this deal goes, it will happen, and then, and then four Northern years Ireland, or possibly in the same six years way, later... In the same way happen. that here, we have an election every... Well, it's supposed to be every five years, sometimes sooner than that there will be... The, Northern Ireland will express its consent every four years to this arrangement. That's an incredibly important new thing that wasn't in the previous deal, that is in this new deal, which is one of the reasons that it's better. But then this is what would happen to begin with. For at least four years, then there'd be a two-year cooling-off period. So for at least six years, that's the situation that Northern Ireland would be in, that they would be governed by some EU laws and by the European Court of Justice when it comes to regulatory alignment. Well, we're currently... Laws that they have no control over themselves. But we're currently, as members of the European Union, for the next fortnight, we are governed by those rules. Mm -hmm. And then every four years, Northern Ireland will be able to choose whether to stick with that. And <coughs> that allows the consent of people in Northern Ireland, based on a majority, uh, to these arrangements. But the crucial thing is that it allows the, uh, the, uh, us to leave the European Union, deliver on the vote, and deliver on the vote in a way... So how that... are you going to deliver on that vote? How, where are you going to get the votes from? Because the DUP at the moment are not at all keen. So where are you going to get the votes from? Well, because this deal is the best way to deliver on the results. So where will we get the votes from? We will have uh, the there's Conservative MPs in Parliament. There are some Labour MPs who are proposing... Uh, to vote for this, there's some independent MPs. So it will be a it will be a cross-party group. Uh, there's some Lib Dem MPs who are talking about voting for it. And, and you give the whip back to the Conservative MPs well, that you took it away from in order to get their, their, I, their vote back. I spend my day job on the health service and improving the NHS. I'm not into the whip's office and the arrangements there. But this deal allows us to move forward. I just want to address as well these points about environmental protections and uh, workers' rights. Of course we'll have stronger environmental protections and we have stronger and strengthening workers' rights. It's that this country will be able to decide on our environmental protections. So, for instance, we're putting up the living wage and we're putting it up to over £10 an hour. That is stronger than what is required by European law. Uh, but the key point is this. When you have a vote as a country, no matter how you voted, we are a democracy and we respect the result of votes. It's incredibly important. And that is why a second referendum would not solve any of this. Do you think that that would end the debate if there was a second referendum? No, of course not. Because people who voted Leave would say, let's have best of three. 
And if we voted to leave second time round, we might as well have just got on and left in a fortnight, and then we can move on. There's not going to be a delay. The EU have said that. There's not going to be a second referendum. Let's get on, vote for the deal, and move the country forward. Uh, Annalise... <laughs> Are Labour MPs going to do what Jeremy Corbyn wants to do? Are they all going to do what Jeremy Corbyn wants them to do and not vote for the deal? Well, I would be very, very surprised if we saw any significant number of Labour MPs voting for this deal. I understand in relation to Theresa May's deal previously, there were some MPs who felt that there were at least those legally binding commitments around working rights and environmental protections there. They're not in this deal. And, you know, I so would just say to you, how many, how many do you think might vote for it? I, I think we're talking about, you know, on, on the fingers of one hand, quite frankly. And, you know, when, when I'm told, I, I, I think probably less than that, when I'm I mean, told that might by get Matt, it too, um, well, when I'm told by him that actually somehow we're going to have these future sunny uplands where we'll have excellent working rights and environmental protections. You know, our country's been taken to court mm -hmm. so many times over our air pollution. We've seen um, rights around temporary workers come from the EU when our government was resisting that in so many areas. It's been the EU that has led on these issues. And that's why the trade unions have said that they're not in favour of this. That's not the Labour Party. It's millions of working people's representatives have said they will not accept this deal because it could water down working rights. They've if made you don't very, like very how clear. this country is run, let's have an election yeah. and then you can put your case to the people. I won't have an election. I won't have an election. I won't have an election. Because I want to have that change, but I agree with what was said before, that actually Johnson said he was going to have this deal, he was going to present it, etc. He was going to take responsibility. Yeah. The reason why he's proposed this is because actually he's not dealing properly with Brexit. He's not giving us... When you keep saying we're going to have it all done, as I've kept saying, this is just about the withdrawal agreement that we've got in front of us. It's not about the future relationship. Okay. It's totally vague. Javid, you're sitting there observing all this. What do you make of it? Uh, I, I think uh, the deadlock can only be broken if there is a refreshed public mandate for the future. And so you're talking a second referendum. I think a, I think a general election is inevitable. I think a general election would be a very, very good way forward. And I look forward to Annalise voting for one yeah. next time the option is put for before the House so of Commons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 would, I would welcome a general election. Um, I, I plan, plan to stand in Ashfield, Nottinghamshire, which was a Leave seat, 70%, where the MP voted to remain and has voted to remain all along. 60% of Labour seats voted to leave. And now you lot want a second referendum. You should be ashamed. You've sold five million people down the river. It's appalling. Back to the, North, back to the Northern Ireland question. I think there's no wonder um, we were hearing on the way out, friends of ours in, in the DUP, so they, they use the word they feel betrayed by, by this deal today. A year ago at the DUP conference, Boris Johnson said he would never put a hard border in the Irish Sea, and he has today. So uh, well, how I mean, do you think they're going to feel? Well, I mean, the polls look quite good for us in Scotland. We're not afraid of a general election. The reason we did not support... Uh, the government's request You're so for one. enthusiastic that the, you re voted against it. If you would just wait till I finish <laughs> that, I would explain why. Because if we'd, allowed the, if we'd allowed the Prime Minister to control that, he would have been able to dissolve Parliament mm -hmm. and take us out with no deal Absolutely. while Parliament the wasn't sitting. The we are been... not stupid. Look, when we put forward the proposal for a general election, the vote would have been two days ago. We would have already had it. Yeah. And, except, uh, except the Prime Minister remains having the power to change the date. So once we'd given him the power to have it this week, he could have said, oh, it's now the 7th of November. You know, my head does not zip mm. up the back. You know, we <laughs> were quite <laughs> aware of what he could do. So you'll get your general election. Don't be afraid about that. But the thing is that, you know, the, uh, Annalise is right. There are things that were in the withdrawal agreement in the legally binding bit around regulation and level playing field and workers' rights that are now in the political declaration. The political declaration is non-binding <laughs> and is therefore not worth the paper it's written on. The only thing it does is give you a flavour, which is that Boris Johnson wants a free trade agreement, not a Norway, not... Well, he would prefer a no deal. And the problem is you're talking about a 5% hit on the economy, the... You know, it's already lost 60 billion. So when Matt talks about we'll be able to spend lots of money on the NHS, we will not. People will be poorer, the public purse will be poorer, and therefore public services will struggle. And therefore, you know, this is not going to be a good thing 
for the UK, and people need the chance to step back and think, is this remotely like what you were promised in 2016? Because I also was watching it like Annalise, and I don't recognise it, and that includes statements from people like it's Farage. It's the same old story. Politicians think they know better than the public. Okay. You, you think you know better than the public. You, you don't think they knew what they voted for. They, they've it changed a, their minds. All of them have died. No, it was a no, How does it sit with you guys? It was a 52-48 referendum. If Theresa May had consulted with people, she would have looked at, my goodness, this was close. What did we hear? An overwhelming vote for Brexit. It was not. It was incredibly close. So, in the same way as we put forward single market and customs union, something like a soft Brexit, OK, they didn't like the political arrangements of the EU, but let's keep the economic benefits of the EU. Whereas that's not what's happening, and this one is further from Europe than Theresa May's. That means more bureaucracy, more friction, more impact on businesses, and more businesses that will just hoof it over to Europe and pull mm. out of places. Mm. I'm going to move on to the subject in a minute, but before I do, I just want to tell you that next week we're in South Shields, where we'll be joined by the film director Ken Loach, and the following week we'll be spending Halloween in Birmingham, <laughs> which, of course, is also the night when we're due to leave the EU. So who knows we where we might be dress. by then. <laughs> if you want to be in either of those audiences, call 0330-123-9988, or you can uh, go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. Right, let's just move on. We have a lot of, lot of questions about uh, this next subject. Lena Shah. Uh, four Bulgarian fans today were fined £443 each and banned from attending sporting events for the next two years for their racist chance um, in the international match uh, with England. Do you think that that goes far enough to tackle racism in sport? Right, well, of course, what you're referring to is the 2020 qualifier between England and Bulgaria, and it was stopped twice yep. in the first half because of fans. They were booing black players, they were making no monkey noises, they were doing Nazi salutes. I mean, Javid, what's... It, it... Uh, I don't think it goes far enough, actually. And firstly, I mean, Great. we should just uh, pay tribute to our black football players that night and the dignity yeah. with which they held themselves. Right. Um, yeah, as, a, as a black British person myself, I know what it feels like you know, to be in the, uh, the, in the face of racism and it's not easy to, to maintain that dignity. So they did an amazing job. I personally think they should have walked off, actually, and been given the game anyway. Uh, but they, d they chose uh, to, to, to speak with their goals and that worked out very well. There is a big problem, I think, here for, uh, for football associations worldwide and our own premiership as well. And, you know, the, the football association here are not exempt. We know there have been incidents in this country uh, on, the, on the terraces where racism has been exhibited. Uh, I think all uh, associations and all football clubs need to take some very serious action right now and be absolutely yeah. clear that on their watch, in their place, there is a zero-tolerance policy. They will not accept anything else. They need to introduce all kinds of initiatives to help with that, you know, whistleblowing and so on, where other fans can actually uh, help clean up the game. But nothing less is going to help. Now, I mean, uh, on the same topic, I don't know if any of you have seen that film recently, uh, Blinded by the Light, by Gurinda Chadha. Well worth uh, watching. The, the, the lead actor is called Javed Khan, but I get no royalties out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with me. But it's, it's, it's about a, a British-Pakistani 16-year-old uh, growing up in Luton in 1987. Yeah. It's, right? it's based on yeah. that. It's well worth a watch because that's the time when the National Front, for example, were really rife in that part of the UK. And it, it goes through how, what it's like growing up in the face of that. And I watched it, and it actually made me think that, you know... Um, how the UK has changed since then in terms of the streets of Britain. Now, I can say as a British, uh, black British, uh, Pakistani, Kashmiri origin, uh, there are parts of this country where I would be in fear of walking alone on those streets. Where, where are you right? thinking? These are, they're, they're, well, you know, there are parts of uh, urban, urban centres, mainly, um, where still it is difficult for someone like me to feel confident walking that street. And I'm born and bred British. What, at, any, at any time of day? Uh, evenings, evenings. Daytime is a little bit easier because it's light. But anyway, as soon as darkness falls, and I know this because people, other people tell me this as well. There may be people in the audience who've experienced similar things. That you don't need to scratch very deep beneath the surface to see this and feel this. People often don't talk about it. These are difficult subjects to talk about. Hate crime is on the rise. You know, it's gone up 10 percent. 
right, just recent statistics, really, and a lot of it is faith-motivated as well, if you're connected. These are issues that we as a country have to deal with, and I think football has a huge responsibility because a lot of young people look up to footballers and football clubs and are influenced heavily in their behaviour, so they've got to set the standard. But it is a symptom of a deeper challenge that we've got in our society, and the only way to deal with these things is firstly to be honest, to talk about them, not be embarrassed, not try and shove it under the carpet, and then those in authority to take responsibility and make some action happen. Yeah, quite right. Come on then, the big yeah, we can all agree that the uh, the treatment of the players on Monday night was uh, abhorrent. But really and truly, isn't it equally important that we remember the historic abuse that the black players uh, received here mm. and how, even though it might not be as clear or as loud on the terraces as it once used to be, we've had examples of Chelsea fans abusing yeah. black, play black people yeah. on the, the, net the, the Metro in France. We've had uh, two, two Premier League players this season be abused on Twitter and the various uh, mainstream media that wishes to uh, continue its trope, stereotyping of black players to their counterparts, their white counterparts. Yeah. Yeah. Back there, at the very back. Going on what that gentleman said, a Leicester City footballer, because of a tackle, was told, I hope your daughter gets cancer. Mm. It's not all just about racial and racial. And the fact that... We're only talking about it now because it's happened to the England players. No, it happens no matter where, to be honest. Premiership, First Division, it doesn't matter. It's happening and need, more needs to be done, whether it's on social media or at the grounds. Man there in the check shirt. Thank you. Um, I think we need to be honest with ourselves and ask the question, do we really think that racism stops once they walk outside of the football ground. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I'd have liked to have seen all 50 or 60 of those guys match stopped, mm -hmm. arrested, and charged with racial, inciting racial hatred. Um, we just don't go far enough. And it would be the perfect platform to get the message out. Do you think any of the others would have carried on chanting if those 50 or 60 had been arrested? Mm -hmm. Might think twice. Okay, and the, the man behind you in the check shirt. Um, I'm proud to be from Leicester. It's one of the most multicultural cities that we have in the UK. Um, but I think this rhetoric that some politicians and entire parties, in the case of the Brexit Party, spout, you know, is really driving up racism in our society. And I think, you know, we have a Prime Minister who has made racist comments in, in you know, public forums. He's been recorded. He's also probably through desperation now, sidling up to one of the most bigoted people in the world, Donald Trump. So how can we sort out racism today when the people in power are saying these kind of things and doing these kind of things? Martin, I mean, is your rhetoric fueling racism as that man is suggesting? No. Uh... I think it's, it's unfair to say that the Brexit party is driving racism like that. I mean, football, football aggro in, in, in Eastern Europe is a huge problem. And it's much worse than it is outside of the UK. And I, I, in the UK, sorry. And I think the only way we can solve this is by, hold, first of all, hold games behind closed doors. So don't let, don't let any home fans go in. If that doesn't work, don't let them play any home games at all. And if that doesn't work, then kick them out of tournaments. Because that's the only way that this will stop. Because, you know, it's all, it's all fair and well saying, let, let's have a social media campaign to, to, in, in, in Macedonia. No, it's not going to work. The only thing that will work is tough action against the teams and denying them watching football altogether. It's abhorrent, it must stop. But, you know, the, the Brexit party is the, is the most diverse party of all of the parties in the, in the, in the European Parliament. You know, it's, it's totally unfair to say that this or anything many, like that, you know, you know comes Asian from MEPs. Brexit. I mean, come on, it's, it's, a, it's a, big, a bit of a, a stretch. Sorry. How, how many black or Asian MEPs have you got, then? Uh, we have five. Yes. Out of... Out, out, out of 29. No, five, five out of 29 is, is what Martin said. It's not bad. It's, I mean, it's think... more than Lib Dems, more than Labour in the European Parliament. OK, well, I'll we'll answer it the question. Is. So I think, I, think, I think there are two issues here. I think the first one, I would go back to what the gentleman said about the fact that actually there is an environment to all of this behaviour and it's not one that just sprung up overnight, although it has intensified and the, and the figures, you know, bear that out very, very clearly that the rate of hate crime has sadly gone up. And I think some of the reason for that is that lots of people who might have held those kind of disgusting opinions before 
sadly feel emboldened because there have been political figures who've behaved in an irresponsible way, who've repeated absolutely disgusting slurs, for example, towards Muslim women that I find really, really repellent, who, who wear the hijab. I just think it's appalling the way that they were talked about by a, a prime minister of our country, who, after all, is in a position of power, whereas many of them are not in that position in relation to him, certainly. So there's been that permissive environment, and I think we've all got to take responsibility for that. And, you know, quite frankly, when I saw some of those posters at the time of the referendum, which it's suggested that, for process. example, well, I'm, I'm sure many of you were involved in, in that campaign... It was campaign UKIP then, of course. When, when you had... Well, I'm, I'm I, I hope was a, you would I, I, disavow... I was, a, I was a Labour supporter then. Well, I saw the light. I hope you would disavow <laughs> some of what we saw back then, which was... For example, denigrating all refugees who come to our country is absolutely it, it, appalling. It, 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 and there's it, it, no surprise that we've seen an increase in hate crimes. So there's <coughs> that side. Then there's the other side of it, which I absolutely agree with the women at the back. It is about also behaviour within football. I should put my cards on the table. My partner's a football referee. Please don't hate me as a result of that. OK, so I, I see it. I see the great side of the game. I see all those people who volunteer, you know, people who give up all of their time to support the kids, the adults, you know, who really enjoy it. But then I also see the language, I see the swearing, I see the shouting, you know, I see the attitude. Now, OK, most of the time that ends when people go into the clubhouse or whatever, when they finish the match. But really, we should be more grown up about this. You know, I shouldn't be thinking, can I take my kids along to a match? Right, that should not be happening anymore. So we've got to deal with that, I think, in the future. Matt, uh, your view on this is, first of all, is enough, uh, has enough been done to tackle racism as far as that Bulgaria game is concerned? But also we've now had... Well, you, Annalise, but also uh, at, the, at the back there, talking about racism in relation to the Prime Minister. Well, I think that not nearly enough has been done. I think that £443 a fine is pitifully low. Mm. I think this was vile behaviour. Um, and I think it's, a, it's another wake-up call. And, but how many more wake-up calls are we going to have to have? Mm. Now, I'm proud of how far as a country we've come. I'm proud that when Javid gave his first response, the whole audience, after what was quite a half-and-half um, uh, half debate on Brexit, the whole audience here, all of you applauded. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of how far we've come, but by God, we've got to have our eyes open to how far there is yet to travel. And that is something that we, as a whole society, have got to do. And What I... do you make of the point from the audience that, that some of the language that Boris Johnson has used in the past has... has... Has, has, has not helped in terms well, of going further as a country. I think that it's incredibly <coughs> important that politicians use language that tries to bring people together. I'm very proud that we have a, a Muslim Chancellor of the Exchequer, we have a Hindu Home Secretary, we have people from all sorts, all faiths, uh, and none around the Cabinet table. I think that is what... Uh, we should judge the Prime Minister on those actions. And I think that the country needs to come together. I mean, I don't, I, one of the reasons I want to get Brexit done and move on is to, because I think that a politics that unites people rather than divides people is the best way that we can do the best for our country. And I think that this, this moment in Bulgaria is something that we, we should watch but we shouldn't just think it happens out in Bulgaria. We've got to stamp it out here too. Woman there at the front. My son was attacked, even though he's the second generation. He was attacked and he was called a Paki. Now you tell me, what, how does a person take a Paki? What do we say? Is that a name, Paki? What is it? I'm not a Paki. He's not a Paki. We're human beings yeah. that are being labelled. Mm -hmm. Why do we have labels? I'm from a Sikh faith. Many of you are from Muslim faiths as well. But we are faiths. We haven't got a label, Paki. And my son said... Mum, what do I do? I work for security. Do I walk around and say, no, I am not a Paki, I am a Sikh? I said, no, son, you are a human being. And the other thing, white supremacy. That's how we feel. I was born in this country. My father served in this country. But it is white supremacy that is dividing everybody. 
I don't like being called a wog. I'm a human being. I went to school, I used to be called curry face. Is that a name? That's disgraceful. I don't like it. We have to abolish all this race, hate, colour hate. You and I, everyone here, has the same amount of bones, same amount of blood. You take my skin off and we're exactly the same. Where has racism come from? I think there's no question that the, the fines of Bulgaria were, you know, small change. They're not remotely enough. And we have uh, clearly had episodes of racism here, not just in football, but in, in other sports and in our uh, mainstream media. I mean, there are newspapers who have anti-immigrant narratives on the front page for almost every single day of the year. You know, that seeps into people. And while many people will have voted leave for a myriad of reasons, the people who are anti-immigrant think 52% of the population agrees with them. Now, that isn't true, but unfortunately, that narrative has gone forward. And the thing is, the examples do come from the top. So to have uh, a prime minister who's talked about, you know, women looking like letterboxes or picking any smiles and think, I'm sorry, and it wasn't even an off the cuff after a couple of glasses of wine. These were written. These were comments that were in articles where you write it, you reread it, you check it, and you actually send it off to your editor. I find it incredible. And the thing is, pop uh, football could actually be a force for good. It is such a popular thing. It's in every community and every society. In Scotland, our problem is probably more sectarian, the whole Catholic Protestant thing. Mm. And the message is important. We had an offensive behaviour at Football's Act. Now, it may have had weaknesses and it may have needed change. But unfortunately, there were members in the Scottish Parliament who took great pride in taking it down and in repealing it. And what we've seen this year is actually more sectarian aggression in Scotland, particularly in the west of Scotland, than we'd had for a number of years. So prime ministers and politicians are important, but the football teams need to hurt. So not just fining the players, not just even fining the team. Take points off them, kick them out, because then all the other fans are going, don't you dare, or we will lose points and we'll go down a league. It's got to be a group thing Yep. that actually the, all the fans together are almost policing themselves yep. because they don't want the club to lose out. Great. Well, our hour is up, and I just want to say before we go that one of the, things, one of the reasons I love this programme is it's wonderful to hear from our panel and to, to hear the points that you make, but sometimes it is from the audience <laughs> that we hear such stunning and extraordinary interventions. And I think tonight, particularly the last few minutes, has absolutely been a case in point. It really has. Um, next week, we are in South Shields, and the following week, we will be spending Halloween, as I said before, in Birmingham. Let's see what happens. So call 0330 If you'd like to be in the audience, you can go to the question line website the Question Time website, and you can follow the instructions there. And if you want to keep getting the latest on Brexit, do you? <laughs> mm, yeah. Not so sure. But stick with BBC One and the hugely popular and brilliant podcast Brexit Cast with Laura Koonsberg and Katia Adler, and that's on straight after this. But for now, thank you very much, my panel. Thank you to the audience for coming tonight, and, of course, to you at home for watching and listening from Leicester. Bye-bye. Stay tuned for that slightly lighter look at the goings-on from Brussels. Brexit cast is here next. There's something here and it hates us. Those children were taken to settle an account. Did you think that we were going to live normal lives? That there'd never be a reckoning? Come work.